Graphic Policy Radio welcomes you to Krakoa, a mutant ethnostate forged after decades of oppression and genocide. You belong here if you're a mutant. It's a giant island that has rocked by the geopolitics of the world as portrayed in X-Men related comics and asks all who encounter it to consider the political implications of this new sort of mutant state. X-Men has always been deliberately political, and the House of X slash Powers of Ten, and now Dawn of X, relaunch of the X-Men comics helmed by Jonathan Hickman, revel in that. It's all X marks the spot at the intersection of comics and politics, and that's what we do here at Graphic Policy Radio anyway. I'm your host, Elon Levin, and joining me are two special guests. Jamel Bowie is a columnist for the New York Times Opinion section, and returning is Spencer Ackerman, national security reporter for the Daily Beast, writing a book, Reign of Terror for Vikings, Spring 2021. Welcome to the show, you guys. Hello. I'm really excited about this, you guys. Yeah, this is like the, this is definitely the uh, people with lots of uh, thinking around the nation state as a construct and <laughs> global politics uh, focused conversation. Um, I've covered House of X Powers of 10 before on, on the show. And I think at this point, we're going to really focus on hearing from you guys rather than from me on this. And um, we'll be talking predominantly about uh, the X-Men series itself within here. So we'll, I'll probably end up talking a lot more about subtextual bisexuality representation with Kitty Pride in a future episode mm-hmm. as opposed to this one. Um, but I want to kick us off by asking you, Jamal, uh, what, you know, you, you looked at uh, the Hickman, Rice, Bryce, and that whole crew. Uh, what do you think about what they're doing with Krakoa as a concept in the comics? Just Krakoa as, as sort of a nation state? Yeah. I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, so when I read this, when I, when I read House of X Powers of Ten, um, and finished it, I was just, uh, so struck. I mean, the thing I was struck most by it was this, was Hickman and, uh, company's attempt to sort of like really take, like, the the idea of a mutant identity is seriously. I don't know. That's the best way I can I can mm-hmm. th- I can articulate it. That this isn't just you know if if this is an identity as well as sort of a you know a, a set of powers a genetic thing. If this is also an identity, um, if these are if this is a people, then what does a people do um, in in the modern world? It attempts to find itself a home. Uh, it attempts to find itself a state, and I, you know, from uh, from the start of that series to the end, I was just very impressed um, by again this again the the decision to sort of take that idea seriously and and try to play it out as much as possible. Um, so yeah, I mean my my like predominant. And I should say, as like background here, my when I was a kid um, and a teenager, like I was mostly a DC guy. Um, hmm. I didn't read a ton of X Men. Like I kind of started reading X Men later uh, as an adult when I suddenly had access through like Marvel Unlimited and other things to like so much more of the of the catalog. Um, and so my like attachment to X Men has never been very strong, and I really jumped at this. Uh, this series as a a way to kind of get a fresh start um, to sort of jump into a storyline kind of knowing who these characters were but not necessarily having a deep knowledge of uh, the various storylines and their histories but being able to go take as much as a blank slate knowing kind of what I know about the basics of X-Men. So Mm -hmm. I'm the exact opposite. Uh, (laughs) I am an X-Men I'm an X-Men lifer I've been yeah. reading the X-Men since I was about probably seven or eight years old. Uh, I had, you know, the typical, like, lapse when you're, you know, like, 15 or so until you're, like, you know, 25, 26. So, like, I missed a lot of, like, late 90s, early 2000 X-Men. But, like, aside from that, I'm, like, a chapter and verse person here. Um, and... To say that uh, the X-Men have experienced, like, 
a generation of creative darkness is not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. And this is the X-Men that I had always dreamed of existing. And like in, in, in my, in my soul, like knew this franchise always was and always could be. Um, So like, I'm very curious, Jamel, in your, uh, in your in your more recent introduction, uh, and your you know your 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 dives through through Marvel Unlimited, what to you are are your touchstone X stories? Like what works for you and what doesn't? So the thing that works most for me, it, it's really kind of only one thing because I didn't know it existed, and then I kind of stumbled upon it and was um, uh, uh, kind of completely sort of taken back by the fact that this thing existed. And I may be getting the, the title wrong. You'll know the title. And it's either, what is it? It's either what? Um, uh, man Kills, God Forgives. God, God Loves Man Kills. Yeah, yeah, God Loves, loves Man Kills, yeah. yeah. And I read that, and I must have read it like three or four years ago. It was just sort of like fucking taken aback by mm-hmm. how, um, <laughs> just like yeah. how visceral it felt. It might have also yeah. been kind of like the, <laughs> the politics of the time as well um of the of the of the past 5 years um but that's that for me is sort of kind of like the x-men story that sticks with me yeah i think uh for for a lot of the the hardcore uh there are a couple stories that define the x-men they typically happen during that era and probably all of them will include god loves man kills um, you know, the X-Men is uh, a series that, you know, for one of its, you know, most persistent uh, and most potent villains, the villain is just called the right. Like, this isn't a subtle series. Like, right. its politics yeah. are not, you know, difficult to discern. But like with any, you know, story that starts from that sort of premise – there's a lot of pressure, um, you know, particularly in a in a you know corporate comic context, to to you know both do it badly, do it ignorantly, or otherwise decide like let's just not do it at all. Um, and so, like, while you have, uh, you know, a franchise that's you know unique, I believe certainly unique until it existed in comics history that would say, let's tell a story about oppression and marginalization from the perspective of the marginalized and they get to be superheroes too. Like is, is, and you know, even, you know, six decades later, you know, kind of amazing that it exists, like that it, that it, that it gets to exist and, you know, can be um, done very poorly, but also done incredibly well. And right now, you know, we're at a period in in which, like, it's I believe like better than than it's been possibly ever. Like, what do you, what do you, Alana? What do you think? You're, you've 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 read tons of X Men comics. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I'm I'm excited that there's somebody who's really has such a big picture view of everything. You know, as I pointed out before, like part of the reason he's able to do that is because he's given a lot of creative control um, and given a lot of freedom that wasn't given to a number of queer and or people of color creators who were working on Xbox prior to this. But, uh, but with his power, he's um, been actually treating it as an, as real science fiction. Um, and like, there hasn't really been as much in the past looking at what are the economic implications of creating a mutant state. Uh, and, you know, cause there's been, there have been utopias before. And utopia was... is one of my touchstone eras. I think that's an mm. incredibly under respected era I think Fraction and Gillen are amazing X writers and are never yeah. thought of as such. No, they are. They're fabulous. They gave us Mr. Sinister that like oh, actually Sinister works. is a system. Like, <laughs> oh, exactly. Um, so you know, I, I think like you know, there have been mutant states before, and but this is this is different than the earlier ones because the way it is articulated is different. And, um, you know, there's a difference between having like almost like a refuge, uh, temporary autonomous zone kind of thing, the way Utopia um, Island was off the coast of San Francisco 
versus like this being like we are a nation and we're going to have diplomacy with you and we're that like that and being able to actually focus on that is really exciting like one important difference is that uh utopia didn't purport to like settle the ideological question within mutant kind let alone between mutant human relations and utopia is dedicated just to that project like utopia is not or i suppose like like any you know conscious construction of a nation state it's an ideological project as much as it is a a a, a political and geopolitical one which you is know, inevitable it, and, and and i wonder why um you know fraction and gillen didn't quite um get there but i cut you off i'm sorry i was gonna say i mean one of the things that i've been but it's been fascinating to me is the you know fans are all super excited about this because this is big picture big thinking you know x-men books uh and that there's so many happening at one time um but uh and i felt like i was kind of one of the only people who was saying like these are amazing but is anybody else worried about some of these implications and everybody's like no ilana you're terrible for worrying about them so i was like you guys might be people who might also be worrying about (laughs) and i don't mean worrying about them from the standpoint of like i think the direction that hickman is taking this is fascinating i'm not worried about like the comics that will come after this i mean that uh you've created an ethno state and as someone who's jewish i have seen how those go it's bad um and uh, i felt like there was a lot of sort of indiscriminate like woo we have it now and you know people it, i don't want to say that this is a complete like metaphor for any you know this is not like 100 percent like metaphor for zionism there isn't uh, there's no napka there's no mass displacement like it's different but i can't just be like this is happy time so I, I, and that's enough for me on that question. I mean, I'd love to hear from you guys about your thought about like, is the, obviously this is, this is good fiction, but like, is the, do you feel like this is, is this an idea that's going to work? Is this an idea that, um, is this an idea that, you know, I, I and I am, I'm entirely sympathetic with, I, I, wa- I, I want it to work for them, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah. Do you want to go first or should I? You uh, Spencer, you go first. I want to hear what you have to say, and then I think I'll... Sure. Um, so, with with any X book, you really do have to ask, like, it, it's going to depend on how seriously they want to take that concept. Like, I, you know, get a whole lot of, you know, from my own, you know, background, inevitably, you know, Zionism vibes, the same mm-hmm. ones that, that you got, but, you know, it, because, you know, Krakoa is not peopled, the 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 analogy really can't you know work what it what what this is is kind of uh the way i don't know a hot haam um you know might have thought of a of a of a jewish state you know without of ever considering that there would have been another people uh and and another you know question of sovereignty um to have to start it's 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 i suppose like uh, when Zionism likes to consider itself innocent. Um, but I, I don't really think beyond there, um, we really do have, you know, much more to the Zionism analogy, except in the generic sense, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, cultural sense of uh, an oppressed people that's been scattered to the wind and vulnerable because of that uh, with a question of coexistence uh, with humanity never really won except a question of momentary survival, uh, needing that refuge and finding suddenly it has a way to do that. And that isn't, you know, necessarily just a, a capital Z Zionist story. That's, you know, that's a story of a lot of people. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, X-Men at its best, uh, you know, works precisely because it can be fitted into a lot of different um, uh, people's contexts. Um, nevertheless, you know, and we see a whole lot with, with X-Men four, um, the way this, this has so many different dimensions, you know, we, we have so many questions about, you know, not just, you know, problems of the nation state, but also, you know, problems within nation states. What kind of nation state is this going to be? Um, we have something of a governing body of the founders of, uh, of utopia, but no one elected them. Nope. 
and no checks in that. Yeah. There, you know, someone like Apocalypse gets to be on it. Like how if you're if you're Archangel or if you're any of the other mutants uh, whom he's tortured into submission and thrall, how do you feel about that? Um, there are lots of people who live on Utopia uh, who've had loved ones killed by Magneto. Um, some people are more, you know, kind of used to that at this point or not. But, like, that's a major question of, of, of what sort of place this is going to be. And then the other people who are on the council are the oligarchs of Utopia, the, the economic driving force of, of the Hellfire uh, East India Company. Um, so, you know, we're perhaps already seeing uh, some uh, some potent uh, ways in which Hickman and team can subvert what they've set up as they establish it more. I mean, it, it, it's funny when I, when I, when I think of analogies <clears throat> to this, what I, what I think of um, are the, are is sort of the pan-Africanism of mm-hmm. uh, early 20th century America. I think of, um, the attempts to create, or, or the the political effort, the radical political political effort to create sort of a, a black homeland within the United States, um, that's its own autonomous nation. And then broadly, just sort of, I think about kind of the formation of the black community itself. And Spencer, your last point gets gets to something that I'll be interested to see explored in this series, which is that for the African American community for most of the nineteenth and twentieth century, the rigidity of the racial caste system um, simply meant that social and class divisions within it weren't as salient. Um, but as that caste system weakens uh, in the middle of the twentieth century, towards the end of the twentieth century, um, the class divisions suddenly become very salient. Um, not as salient as they might be in the absence of any kind of like racialized system around them, but still very uh, salient. And these questions of, you know, and you can relate it to X Men, right? It does we're all mutants, and we're all we all do face this sort of fundamental threat. But um, our mutant hoods are different. Um, mm-hmm. Our relationship to sort of the factions within mutant hood are different. The fact that we've been able to say we have this homeland Krakoa, we uh, have this language, where we, we've agreed to a set of um, laws and ethical commitments doesn't change our respective histories and doesn't really fully alleviate um, uh, whatever tensions came before. And I will be... Interested to see how the series explores that, um, because it's if they if if Hickman and the team go in that direction, it does I think open up a very rich vein of storytelling um, and, and an opportunity to explore these particular issues um, in a way I'm not really sure a superhero comic book has ever really done. And it's kind of tragic that you know, we have to wonder if a superhero comic has done it because by nature of what X-Men is, by nature of what the story X-Men purports to tell cannot help but be, it kind of should have been explored already, right? Um, One of the things that as a 30 plus year X-Men reader has been like a source of very ironic frustration to me is that Outside of establishing that there are, the, there are these twin poles um, concerning the relationship to humankind of Charles Xavier and Magneto, which is even not really about, you know, what it purports to be about because Magneto is, is explicitly a mutant supremacist. Um, aside from that, you don't really have a lot of particularly substantive exploration of the varieties of, of ideological factionalizations and their commitments um, and how, you know, they would manifest, you know, in a fight, um, you know, the, which is the way these, these sorts of soap operas tell themselves uh, with avatars, um, doesn't really happen particularly much. And when it does, um, not particularly thoroughly. Um, you know, one example that I, 
I kind of come back to is that there's something called the Mutant Liberation Front. And outside of a generic commitment to, like, committing mayhem on behalf of mutants and being terrorists, I couldn't tell you what it stands for. It's not, you know, Alana, you may, I think you have, you have, you have a disagreement with me, and, and it may be that it's because you've read more um, yeah. of, of, of MLF stuff than, than I have, but, mm. like, it's not there. Like, I could not tell you if the MLF are, you know, Magneto people. I could not tell you what their uh, criticisms of Magneto are, their, their relationship, aside from, like, thinking, you know, the X-Men are, like, lame normies. Um, yeah. And, like, that's a real the problem. the x lame normies is definitely part of it. <laughs> but, like, um, that's a real problem, I think, in a, in a, in, yeah. in a book like this. And, and uh, a real missed opportunity for storytelling. Um, there are, and I'm not saying there have not been excellent treatments of the X-Men's politics. I think they have. I think crafting an ideology uh, is different. Um, mm -hmm. Showing the coherence of it, where the coherence fails, who the coherence, uh, who, the, who the ideology necessarily fights, who it, who it will tolerate and that sort of thing, um, really matter, um, particularly if you're going to, you know, go into, you know, really in-depth storytelling. Aside from that, you just sort of get like, Apocalypse is this like weird blue-lipped Darwinist uh, who can't die. And like, that's not particularly ideologically compelling or interesting, like outside and or rather the way in which it could be as like an inspiration for like violent nihilist and fascist right wing movements. They don't write apocalypse like that and they don't write Akaba no. uh, like that. Right. Like it's, they, it's yeah. just sort of not there. Well, this is the most interesting apocalypse has ever been without a question to me. In ever. Series. No, I mean, I don't, I don't know if folks saw like in, um, I'm a bit behind on Excalibur, but like in Teeny Howard's like stuff on Excalibur, like he's renames himself. Yes. A with symbols around it. And it's, you know, Excalibur is the book that's dealing most with the magical world. So obviously, you know, naming yourself is a feature of magic, but it's also a political act, right? Like mm -hmm. you're renaming yourself because you're giving yourself a new political significance. It's also a name that is unpronounceable to those who don't speak Krakoan. Um, and that was just a great character shift, I thought. But um, like, okay, so not only do I love it, um, yeah. what I think, the, you know, amongst the... the the, the things it has shown to me is that Hickman and, per, and, and I have every confidence in this team. I want to get that out of the way. Uh, this is, this is critique. It is not criticism. Um, if that, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, the, the moment that it, it really seemed to occur to me in Hoxpox that Hickman means to say that uh, Krakoa has settled or at least put in abeyance the mutant question, the question of mutant ideology wasn't, you know, the Xavier Magneto Alliance because, like, you know, flip a coin in any status quo and, you know, their friends or their, their, their enemies. But when Apocalypse, like, shakes Xavier's hand and is like, I'm with this. And, like, that's shocking and it, it seemed to say mm -hmm. to me that, you know, it warranted kind of a greater story and exploration about why Apocalypse should think that, like, mutant kind giving up explicit dominion to the entirety of the Earth and pursuing a strategy of economic, uh, as we see in X-Men 4, which we can talk about in a second, um, yeah. strangulation. Um, I can see why that might be appealing to Apocalypse, but, like, I, I, I need to know a little bit more, right? Um, because, you know, either this sets you up in a way that it goes very ideological and, and explores precisely those differences in ideology that Krakow is supposed to reconcile, or it's going to do the exact opposite and not deal with those questions at all and just sort of treat it all as a settled issue and possibly to subvert that issue in the form of fighting, sub subvert that, that, that settled issue in the form of fighting later on. And, you know, we, we see, you know, there... Every time there's a utopia, there's always a schism. Um, so, yeah. you know, I'm not saying I don't expect that, but um, ideology is something that, that I found has been 
uh, a weak point in a franchise where it's always just sort of naturally set up to be a strong point, and I'm really, really hoping that, that that's what we'll ultimately get with Dawn of X. Well, characters do talk about their politics a lot. What I think is missing is political organization around those different political ideologies. I mean, we do, there is a reason why X-Force was X-Force and X-Factor was X-Factor, like in the heyday of those old series, right? Like one of them was like, we're going to do this as basically terrorists, and the other was we're going to do this through the government. You know, like, and those were political, fa- those, that was a political ideology driven schism within the X-Men that resulted in, you know, concrete political outcomes. But, um, but I think there could be so much more for me, based on how much time I spend trying to like stop like my Bernie and Warren friends from yelling at each other. There could be a lot more time <laughs> spent on dealing with the internal politics of like, are you a Scott Summers guy or are you a Magneto guy? Or are you, right? a, yeah, or like, so I want to push back a little. Because, okay. yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, as a matter of just, like, resting fact, you know, the X, for, the, you know, the, the, uh, the X Factor team that is, like, the government mutant super team is going to have different politics than, than the ones that are, like, running around in abandoned bunkers and blowing stuff up. The trouble I have with X Force is that you, you – and I think X Force is one of the best concepts uh, in, in – um, in all of mutant kind. I love it. Uh, I mean this unironically. Uh, I, I, you know, we, we all go through, you know, our cycles of, of life eld. Um, and, and, <laughs> I don't, and, but and yes. <laughs> my, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm straight up pro. I'm, 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 I'm a Rob, I'm a Rob Stan. And like, nevertheless, when it actually got to, to being fleshed out, like you just sort of knew that like X-Force was just about being extreme it wasn't like what was like the version of Xavier's dream it was fighting for. Like it, it was pretty agnostic about about that. You knew it was in the kind of D and D sense, like roughly aligned with X Men, but you know the the the, the like the the ideology was tacit rather than developed, let alone explicit. Mm-hmm. One of the ways in which you can sort of see that is that like, and I think this is also true in many cases of of other X teams as well. Like, the choice of enemies isn't an ideological choice. It's just, like, whoever's, like, on a rampage or something, you know, from the mutant sense. Or, you know, it's a, it's a human terrorist group and there has to be a, you know, a, 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 self, a self-defense action for that um, preemptively or otherwise, right? So, you, you know, you can, you can sort of see kind of two very, you know, blurry and um, unspecified and undeveloped forms of, of, of ideological presentation in X-Men. One, the politics of survival between humankind and mutant kind, and then the kind of politics of, of, of supremacy within mutant kind from, from Magneto to Xavier as opposite poles. But, you know, we all know there's so much more of ideology than that, and particularly in uh, the ideologies that uh, develop and form constituencies and form like real you know, deep commitments within marginalized, amongst marginalized people. Right. Jamel, I want to ask you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just to, to jump off of, jump off of that. That's, I'm just trying, I guess I'm just trying to, I'm like thinking through the kind of things we haven't seen. And so just to take the X-Force example, the, the X-Force series that sort of is stuck in, in my head, the one that I, um, have re- reread a couple times is from Rick Remender's X Force oh. from mm. what was that mm. ten years ago or so? Yeah, yeah. nearly so. Um, yeah. And uh, you know the premise of that is that they they go and they with a kill baby apocalypse, um, and it's the rest of the series is basically should we have done this? Um, what are the consequences of having done yes. this? Was this immoral? And I think if if you were gonna dig into that from an ideological perspective, there is actually a politics you can imagine flowing out of that. What does X-Force do? X-Force is broadly aligned with Xavier, but it believes that there are things that must be done that cannot be done in the open that uh, may even, that may be in tension with what Xavier wants, but nonetheless are necessary for creating the the world that he envisions. And so we are going to do those things. Um, And in the context of a nation state, 
right? The kinds of people who participated in that kind of activity may have a very different sense of what dealing with other nation states is going to look like, what dealing with other mutants is going to look like within the mm-hmm. nation state. And those are the kinds of um, differences, not just those are tactical and strategic differences, but also ideological differences that the series seems to set up. I mean, the fact that Apocalypse is a part of this almost implies an entirely an entire story, right? Like, mm-hmm. no, precisely because, and as far as I know, Apocalypse has always just been sort of like, oh, he's like a really bad dude. Like, that's why it's called <laughs> Apocalypse. Um, yeah. But the fact that we see them approach him and he agrees um, seems to suggest so much more and seems to, again, imply um, imply a kind of ideological difference that we haven't really seen. And I think that's that's sort of what, what I think works about this series, just to step back a little, is that so much of it implies things that can be filled in, filled in later. Um, mm-hmm. But by, by simply taking, by going in this direction and by sort of treating certain things, not as settled, but sort of like, oh, of course, of course this crew of people would have a set of interests that need to be assuaged, even though you've never actually seen that really ever happen. Um, it, it opens a door for to a lot of different approaches you could take. So, like to 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 give like one one example that that it stays with the X with with the X Force example. Um, the era right before uh, the Remander one uh, was was one in which X Force was basically. Uh, Cyclops is JSOC. And Jason, you should explain that. Yeah, so <laughs> the the Joint Special Operations Command, basically like the people uh who like killed Osama bin Laden. Um the 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 real the dirty work of Empire. Yes. Um uh highly kinetic uh an intelligence operation as much as it is uh, uh a rating a rating one. Um and you know this was uniformly shown as an external activity. Sorry for the pun. Uh, that that <laughs> Cyclops needed someone, basically, like, he needed, like, Wolverine, X-23, Warpath, Archangel, Psylocke, uh, Wolfsbane, like, the, 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 the killers of the X community to, like, go kill the right. Like, go kill the League of Humanity and so forth. Um, what you never saw, what and like that's been a, that's been kind of a default like mode of X Force. Um, it takes like departures uh, to do something like a uh, a remender. Um, what you what you never see, even though you kind of suspect like would actually happen in a circumstance like this, is X Force used on other mutants as part of a political purge. Yeah. And like, I'm sorry, I want to see that shit. Right, mm. <laughs> right. right. You I mean, want to you, you. you want to see Wolverine, right? Decide yeah. that there is a group of mutants on Krakow that, too too dangerous that can be allowed to be allowed to live. Or, and and like, it could just be ideologically dangerous. Right, right, you know, like, exactly. This, this ain't personal, Bobby. I mean, you know what uh-huh. it makes me think of um, uh, to stay within Marvel. It makes me think of Tanahasi Coates's work on Black Panther that. It could um, go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, Jamel, what are your thoughts on the East India Trading Company? I'm sorry, the uh, Hellfire Trading Company, like as a, an, as a like how it's done, how that's dealt with in the comic as a concept for like doing um, economic power, waging economic war in a way that will like re- you know result in fewer deaths and more peace, but. I don't know. What do you yeah, think? So I, I guess I have a question. I don't know much about the Hellfire Club. Is um, Has this always been a part of kind of the mythology of the Hellfire Club? Have, have no, they all- they're, they're using a name of a group of people who were the elitists basically having like a club to it's, rule the world and have like fetish gear with each other. It's, and it's weird it and out. horny. <laughs> yes, they're weird. They, it's always historically been weird and horny elitists. Um, and... And that was one of the reasons why using the name for something that like was being like to wage 
you know, economic pressure with and not war was an interesting choice. But then it's also constantly referencing that it's referencing the East Asia Trading Company, which is like terrible. Right. So. Um, I guess this this is a, a big, provides a segue into the, the most recent issue of X Men, um, mm-hmm. but I mean I, I find it interesting having just read that issue. Um, what I find interesting is how it's being leveraged as almost a critique of kind of like the Western economic model, mm-hmm. um, and how you know the what what. Uh, Hickman seems to be doing with the Hellfire Club um, is uh, is almost is to say almost to the human world. Um, I mean, and I think Magneto explicitly says this in the issue that like this is how you guys do things, um, and we have learned that uh, sort of direct confrontation, showing our strength, just isn't worth. The trouble we'll, we'll never win that way, but what we can't. How we can win is by extending a kind of peaceful hand and using that um, to undermine you from within to to own you. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's I think that's super interesting. I'm not sure I have much more beyond to say. I would lo- I would love to hear what Spencer thinks about it. Yeah, so thank you so much. Because <laughs> I think X-Men 4 is one of the greatest issues of X-Men in the history of its publication. Uh, for me personally, it is the issue that I've always like dreamed of reading. Uh, X-Men has never had an economic critique. It is never, uh, aside from, I want to be clear, I, d- I don't ever mean to say that X-Men has not been and broadly speaking, the X books have not been at many times like very radical. They have been absolutely in terms of representation, uh, an uneven record, but certainly one uh, of a, of a book whose logic compels it to be. Um, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that uh, from the standpoint of, of, of demonstrating uh, and using for storytelling purposes as well as for, for moralistic ones and telling stories about the world we want to see, ideology, for one reason or another, has been something of, 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 a, of a failing of the X-Books. Um, and now we're seeing ways in which that might no longer be true. Um, mm-hmm. There is a famous story um, called The Trial of Magneto. Uh, in which humankind finally like puts Magneto on trial for crimes against humanity. And we see Magneto in the dock defending himself and kind of giving his apologia, like explaining what he went through, uh, how the death camps made Magneto um, and how, uh, you know, on and on and on. But nevertheless, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, like, you had Magneto explaining himself and defending his life. This is the anti-trial of Magneto that I've been mm-hmm. waiting for my entire ex-fandom. This is now Magneto finally dictating terms to the world. Not like, you know, waving nuclear submarines above his head and talking about how, you know, the fall of humanity is nigh. Now he's saying explicitly, I am going to use in the service of my people's survival uh, that you have called into question and now made necessary, the way I will ultimately secure our liberation is through an externally focused neoliberalism that will ultimately lead you to sell you the rope that I'm going to use to hang you. Yeah, I was just about that. I was just about that. Like that line immediately popped in my head as you were, as you were ch- uh, chatting. It's, it's, um, it's uh, the Magneto as Lenin. It, it, it is. I, I, I just like I couldn't believe, and and like is one of many incredible lines in that comic, including yeah, like Magneto saying like you you people are ignorant, 
this line I love so much, and there's so much contained uh, within it um, in terms of of how dominant powers uh, create uh, ideological status quos that the rest of us have to accept or mm -hmm. have to, you know, when we challenge, have the extra burden of challenging it. He goes, you cannot blame us for the long history of man, nor can you blame us for the circular nature of it. Right now, you people are institutionally teaching your children to rewrite and unlearn history. Well, I promise you one thing. We will never forget where we came from, but you will. You always do. And, you know, I'm reading that, and, like, the first thing I think of uh, has been the hysteria around the 1619 Project. Oh, yeah. And what I think is really at stake in that hysteria, what the people yelling at, at you and at Nicole Hannah-Jones and at the New York Times, what they're yelling at is that they demand an insistence on rewriting and unlearning history because they can't bear to break for various commitments, the circuit, or they do not stand prepared to break what Magneto calls the circular nature of the long history of man. Yeah. I mean, the X-Men at Davos itself mm -hmm. is such an amazing thing to have somebody do, like to even to acknowledge how like the World Economic Forums and things like that are actually significant in those ways and um, was just such a great, a great choice. Well, and, and especially because you notice that the X-Men need to dictate the terms of mutant human relationships somewhere. And it's not, for instance, at the United Nations. Yeah. It is Hickman making a deliberate point about who, in fact, determines the world. And you there's notice so, there, yeah. yeah, there's so much critique of capitalism in this series. It's, it's really nothing quite but nice, you know. I mean, it even you know when Shaw says you know you know human you know one percent of the humans control ninety percent of the wealth, and of course Shaw has always been with that one percent. Right. But um, I, I've always appreciated the moments in the series where they actually are referring to real world fact stories and. Um, <laughs> and information in it and le a little bit more like Neh, when they've gone hardcore fictional in you, a way. You know that Sebastian Shaw has been on Jeffrey Epstein's plane <laughs> with like Bill Clinton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and like Just, the people, yes. the people around this table at Davos are such pieces of shit. Like after Magneto gives the, the Huxley quote, someone says, I find it mildly amusing to make your point. You have to quote a human author. Then again, there aren't many famous mutant authors, are there? And, and like, comics, someone, yeah. someone has been, like, in all of our mentions, like, saying <laughs> shit like that right, at right, some right. point in time. I mean, it is, uh, it, it is striking how um, in, in the first issue of House of X, the sort of the state, the... the Statement of Mutant Independence, the Declaration of Mutant Independence, um, comes with this economic hand, this economic uh, offer. Um, that from the beginning, Hickman is uh, sort of. I mean, the economic the the, the critique shows up right in the beginning, and it is, um, yeah, making a statement about where power lies in the world and um, the thing that may end up threatening Krakoa in the end, right? Not so much that it's an island full of powerful people, but that it is a, it is a self-sufficient economic unit that can undermine the rest of the world. And that in terms of the thing that makes Krakoa most economically relevant to the rest of the world it's presented as solving a problem, solving an existential problem. Right. Solving an existential problem that speaks to uh, the anxiety that humans feel about mutants, which, you know, boils down to you will not replace us. Right. That, that Krakoa is now manufacturing cheap drugs, cheap life-extending drugs, and, and dispensing with that for the rest of the world on terms that humanity does not unilaterally set. And there is 
uh, a real, you know, you know, narrative genius there that, that X-Men 4 uh, really captures, but also, you know, a sophistication there, a, 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 a will, I shouldn't say that, I should say an understanding and a willingness to tell the story that doesn't really get told in superhero comics very, very much, or, or certainly um, very, very well, uh, that, like, this is a story of economic subjugation, and this is how that story plays out. This is what it looks like. These are the sort of people who are involved in it and their institutional roles and so on. And you see Magneto, you know, doing nothing but carving and eating a steak and and explaining why, ultimately, he they're all checkmated to Krakoa by the terms of the world that they have set up. Yeah, which is why they're also constantly trying to deal with these assassinations and like, yes, you know, sub, sub, like wars below the surface as they can't declare a public one. Jamil, do you have thoughts going, going back to, to Hox Pox? Like, do you have thoughts about how the the far future uh, as, you know, in the, the the many possible far futures and stuff like that, like how, how that's talked about and, and um, what the story is, is saying about it? I mean, I guess if, um, you know, if, if the, the present day of the world of, of House of X is sort of operating on kind of like a quasi, you know, left wing, um, Marx inflected critique of, of global capitalism, the, the, the message of powers of 10 that like the mutants always lose in the end, that there's at the end of the day, there's not really any way to, um, uh, secure mutant kind's future, um, and that anti mutant sentiment is just sort of like a permanently ingrained part of humanity. That part seems to, I mean, just like that, that, that would be ideological in the Marxist sense, right? That it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, treating the, the, this epiphenomena of, um, uh, the relations of production is the thing driving history, uh, and just from a narrative level, I, I didn't. It, it's just sort of like I get why it's there, um, but I it, that was like the stuff I found least compelling, um, and least interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like as I think mm-hmm. back, as I think back on power, Powers of Ten, it's sort of I. It was almost like. For me, it was a little disappointing. I was like, okay, I see what, I, I see what they're doing. I see how... Um, I see that Hickman is trying to uh, set up this timeline as the one, you know, the one where everyone, or at least Xavier and uh, Mora, have their... They know what other paths have been taken. They know what mistake, mistakes have been made. They're going to use that to move forward. But um, I don't know. It left me... I be feeling not feeling cold, but just sort of like uh, this feels very utilitarian. Hmm. Um, do you have thoughts about sort of in general with um, the, the 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 way this story has used external materials like uh, like um, and this is for both of you guys uh, about the the CIA, the, the uh, CIA briefings um, and the um, the charts and stuff like that to communicate information. I mean, that's like a Hickman special. That's the, sort yeah. of like one of the things he, he does. Um, I honestly haven't thought much about it. Like I've really taken that okay. on the surface level just for like, Oh, that's this fine. is, you know, having read all of the Avenger stuff he did and all of the fantastic four stuff he did. I was like, Oh, this is, this is kind of his, his style. Spencer, do you have any deeper, thought on it no i i I liked it for that reason that it was hickman uh planting a flag on the franchise no one tells stories in comic books the way he does and so they all now just feel um you know from a from a storytelling perspective more coherent um and and Mm. driven uh by him um it, it it occurred to me that like one of the the things that 
I honestly don't even know if he's still publishing this. It's been I it's it's been so long. Um, his image series Black Monday Murders uh, is incredible and very text heavy. Um, really, even more so in terms of data dumps. And one of the reasons is is he's he's saying that finance capitalism is is black magic. Um, that's that's the story, and it's great. Um, but um, it you know it. We've lived through a whole lot of uh, X-Men status quos that have promised way more than they've been able to deliver. And that's not the case with Hickman. I, I, I love the, the flash forward stuff, but even if you don't, you know, really need, um, you know, because it's Hickman and because the ideas are so enormous, you know, he's given he's given us like three decades worth of, of, of story veins to mine. Um, and you know, the fact that we learn in the future that Krakoa lasts a little over a hundred years, um, that, uh, humanity essentially, you know, has this will toward reinvention, um, for, for compel for survival. We learn, Mm -hmm. you know, from, from the flash forwards as well, that, uh, humanity uh, essentially like gives itself the techno organic virus yeah. um, and becomes yeah. more um, more cybernetic in a in a, in a way to uh, outcompete and refuse to evolutionarily, I suppose, give up. Um, which is also another way of demonstrating that humanity does not see coexistence as ultimately possible, and and that you know fundamentally, as long as that remains the case, then Magneto is right. He's not right ever for a moment about being a supremacist, but he has to be right that coexistence ultimately um, is is at most transactional, and at the and and we would also have to say in that case that that Xavier before this moment is wrong, and yeah. and now we see what Charles Xavier in X Men Four is really about. Um, it it may you know. I go back, I'm looking at the cover in front of me, um, and as, you know, they're walking away from the table, and it's Xavier in the foreground, uh, Magneto over his shoulder, and Apocalypse over Magneto's shoulder. And that ultimately is the order of battle for this issue. Right. Um, that even though it's a Magneto issue, this is the first time in Hoxbox that we see Xavier take off the helmet, which yeah. is also just a wonderful inversion. Magneto, was, but, yeah. Magneto has no helmet on. And also we were just, we'd been wondering, like, are we, are we sure that that's actually for sure mm-hmm. Professor X? And now it's like, no, you're definitely supposed to think that. Jamel, do you have thoughts about, like, the political system that's being developed on Krakoa with the Quiet Council and the general benevolent dictatorship that they're running over there? I mean, it seems to be a recipe for future tension that for now in kind of the euphoria of liberation, um, all is well. But as, you know, as Krakoa faces external threats, as uh, mutants within begin questioning, we don't, and, and as we don't know if the constituent members of the Quiet Council, if they are all really on the same page, um, mm-hmm. uh, this is all new for them as well. And so as those tensions develop, um, this does not seem like, to, to, to my eyes, it'll be entirely stable um or long lasting i think too that there's i mean the 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 mutant plan for economic domination is as presented from by magneto um appears to be kind of something that krakow is unified behind but we don't really know that at all we don't know how the rest of mutant kind is going to um, perceive that kind of strategy. And so assuming this is going to be a story that deals with these internal differences, um, I will be interested to see uh, how they play out. I mean, you know, me personally, I I do not think it's a good thing for a, um, a state to be governed so undemocratically. And I, I have to think that that's going to be a tension that emerges. I also think there, there has to be something that emerges around the whole thing 
about Xavier copying the brains of every mutant and you know resurrecting mutants willy nilly. That seems like it should produce something. <laughs> some I sort think, of, some sort I of think inter- you should read Marauders. If okay. I, if I was going to recommend one more comic for you based on that from the Dawn of X, Marauders is Marauders is it. And you won't see all of that immediately, but by issue two, you're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, Ilana was right. I should be reading Marauders. Okay. <laughs> that's that's what the only criticism I really have. Well, I have actually a couple criticisms of Marauders, but we don't have to <laughs> we don't have to do that. Um, I you know, it's X Men. You know. When there's utopia, inevitably there's schism. Um, just to, to piggyback on your points, Jamel, um, it's a it's it's going to be a question to me of how ideologically that schism is going to be. Um, you know, it's not just the case that the Quiet Council is undemocratic. It's that like we don't really see anyone on Krakoa like particularly interested in politics on Krakoa. Mm-hmm. Like it's it, like right now it's a really big party um, and occasionally, you know, they split up into into X teams and and each do their thing. Um, we're we're not getting a sense that uh, there is much in the way to to debate there. And, and, you know, I have, you know, a that's not a tenable situation and B, I have more faith in in Hickman and everyone um, who's who's developing X comics to think it is it's just going to be a question of like what are the axes on which these these splits happen how ideological will they will there be or could it just you know be kind of raw power struggle um i you know think that you know one thing that we really haven't seen something that's also been kind of taken for granted and you see this with the story page explanations that's always mutants around the world are flocking to Krakoa to, for safety, freedom, and to be part of the first, you know, mutant society. Well, we know from the real world that, you know, not everyone's going to do that. That, you know, people's, however you might think in the abstract, you know, particularly when considering marginalized people and minority groups, um, you know, commitments to home and commitments to what they know and commitments to the people around them, you know, are, are really strong and people's instinct um, is is not to make their you know most often dramatic breaks in their in in something as intimate as their their personal lives and 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 leaving oh. everything for everywhere and like the only circumstance we've seen so far and it's in Marauders is that yeah. there's mutant kind waiting to be saved by Krakoa and I don't think that can really be the whole story here. You know, I will say this about the mutant metaphor. The one space in which it works really well for this is actually you have, you know, less so today possibly than when I was younger, but, you know, queer people choosing to completely leave their families and reimagine their lives in a completely different that's location. That's true, yes. So, but it is, but that's not, and, and, you know, but that isn't always the way it is for folks. That's for true. Sure. But, but I'm, gl- I'm glad you brought up that counterexample because that's an important one. What, what I guess I, I mean also is that like, you know, there are also going to be, you know, by nature of being X-Men, certain X-Men who I don't think are being ideologically consistent, even if they are being personally consistent in following Xavier and all their friends, which might actually undermine my own point or, or possibly demonstrate it, depending on how you look on it. Like Beast, right? Beast mm-hmm. is the ultimate mutant integrationist. Beast has yeah. been an Avenger. So right? is like, Wolverine. Wolverine. So is Wolverine. Always... But like Wolverine's yeah. a different case and we can get into that. And, and yeah. But like I would expect that someone like Beast would, would at least have, you know, conflicting feelings about saying I'm living on an island and like I'm never going to see my buddy Wonder Man except in like certain circumstances. And, you know, it'll be nice to like reminisce and, and, and FaceTime or something like that. But like I am now part of this very different uh, project uh, politically and ideologically. Wolverine, I cannot wait to see what they do with him. I love Wolverine. Wolverine is is uh, as basic as it is. Uh, probably my favorite character. My other favorite character is Namor, um, who I don't okay. think belongs in X Men, uh, but okay. we don't have to get into that right now. Um, but like Wolverine is an ideological exception. Wolverine is Wolverine's here for his family. Wolverine's here for the people uh, that helped him uh, find his 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 soul again after a life of pure torture um, and, and learned helplessness. Um, and, and that's a profound story, but it's also different um, from Wolverine 
you know, most often than not in his character history, even in the main X books as opposed to his his own books and his stuff outside of the X world, doesn't very often take an explicit position on mutant kind aside from we ought to survive and have rights and dignity. Um, it's not really a character who's had much in the way of ideological coloration, and it's not an engine of that character. So I'm very interested in seeing how uh, Hickman-era Wolverine is going to be portrayed. So, Jamel, um, I want to wrap with you. Uh, do you have any last thoughts about about the, the series? I guess for now, I, I just echo what I've said earlier. I think this is very exciting. Um, it's just very exciting to see a comic book series play with these very big ideas and these um, very relevant ideas about not just uh, uh, belonging and and culture and um, the the nation state, but also uh, ideas around you know global capitalism, ideas around um, sort of the what what is the right path to take for a marginalized people in a hostile world um i'm very i'm just very excited to read this this is you know this has gotten me uh back to my local comic book shop and like having a pull list and everything so i'm i'm um yeah i'm just thrilled to see where this goes i i think this is uh shaping up to be just like a remarkable uh piece of narrative fiction and um i hope it's recognized as such well thank you for joining us and i would love to have you back anytime in the future because i think that there is going to be a lot of substantive story to continue to talk about oh my pleasure happy to be here and for our readers we can obviously find you in the page of the new york times as well uh as on twitter uh what's your twitter handle again my twitter handle is just uh, j buoy j b o u i e um my name on twitter is b boy buoy bass like the beastie boys <laughs> uh song um but it's just me <laughs> Awesome. Thank you again. And Spencer, where can folks find you on uh, the internet? I'm, I am at uh, thedailybeast.com most days, uh, writing about, at this point, um, Iran. Uh, I'll be, you can find me uh, in your local bookshops um, next spring. Um, that's spring 2021 uh, uh, for my book, Reign of Terror, uh, which is the story of how the war on terror over the course of a generation uh, destabilized America in a nationalist direction that became one of the pathways that uh, wrote that Donald Trump rode into power. Um, you can also find me uh, on Twitter at Attackerman. And I'm so the book the book could not be more timely, sadly. Um, and I'm on Twitter a little too much. E L A N A underscore Brooklyn. That's Elana underscore Brooklyn. Graphic Policy Radio is on every podcast platform I can think of. And this is what we do. We dig into the conversations around politics and comics um, and in comics adjacent media. So, uh, you know, we're covering Watchmen very soon. We just covered Mandalorian. And um, we we are definitely if you're looking for the kind of people who are excited to see X-Men go to Davos, this is the podcast for you. So I hope you guys will stick with us. And as we always say, thank you. Keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.